Are you seeing them show up? I am seeing everyone here. <laughs> One of us is going to need to uh, yeah, I'm getting ready. silence. Um, in the car, it's done. Uh, I've got to get everybody in the Oh, I know we'll have to go back to the next class. I won't be able to do So we'll say yes. Well, look who's there. John, right? We know John. I'm David. Friends with the. He's been in Noah High for thirty years. He, John. Yeah, we uh, met before. Uh, yeah, we saw uh, Havner, and he's he's from. Uh, he's, how many people are this call? You've got. No, no, I'm just saying because is there anyone else in the room? Oh. Is there anyone else in the physical room that's also on the Zoom? No, just me. And I'm gonna I'm gonna show the group picture from here. So you guys, oh my gosh, you got all the good to see all you guys. Yeah, John, John um has mostly had a relationship with uh, with Goldstein. Hold on, let's use the right. But he runs um, um uh, drug and alcohol rehab over here in Baytown. And he's implemented Noahide ethics within the program. It's really kind of a she bites. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> or is this the woman's side and that's the men's side? No, that's so not. <laughs> but you can sit though. Huh? I'll sit on you the can Yeah, it's fine. I'll sit right in. Let everybody get a view. Hello, everyone. Sorry, I'm late. Well, you're found yeah. Thirty-seven minutes. Thirty-seven. Minutes. Of course, I I'm like a mile, two miles from the Beltway, so I hit the Beltway. Boom, mm -hmm. down fifty-nine. That's like my view. Yeah, I need to get something to place it up where it's. I think what, maybe to this day? It's, it's not... So much gadgetry here. <laughs> That's like people Perfect. arriving around the table. <laughs> <laughs> then you're going to drink, you're going to drink, you want to take a sip of your coffee. <laughs> Slurp it all up. Actually, I do. Yesterday, we spent. Maybe uh maybe we'll get that um paper towel stand. Put it over there. No, no, I am saying we should put it over here to support support Rod's phone. Yes. With all the other oh okay, okay, okay. I see. We're getting high tech here. That's why they call this the torch center. Yes. <laughs> yes. So we could all be tortured. Oh, you don't bring it up. Nathaniel looks like he's got a really cool uh, no. hat on. That's the, the fan. The fan hat. Yeah. <laughs> I want one of those. <laughs> okay. It's good to see everyone, uh, both y'all here in person at the Tour Center and y'all over here on the Zoom. Um. It's um it's wonderful, wonderful to be here. Um, I I warned everyone that there's no heating. Well, there is some heating in the torch center, but it's kind of in the other room. So um, all good. Yeah, it's fine. Everyone's wearing a sweater. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, I'll wear my muscle shirt. It's Houston. Why do you need heating? That was the follow. That was the theory. Super fun. I wear long. <laughs> but uh it's great to be here so what we'll do i guess is like what we typically do and that is we'll have the class everyone will be on, on mute and then we'll open the floor for questions uh what do y'all say about that sounds good sounds like a plan 
بالفعل yes. oh pass got some uh fireworks there in the background okay 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 let us begin our family was blessed this past week with a tremendous blessing uh, my wife Chaya and I merited to have a new baby on Sunday night oh, oh. and uh, we're very thankful and we're very appreciative of course to the Almighty for this tremendous gift and please God the bris will be tomorrow we were originally scheduled to do it in the torch center but it's supposed to be one of the coldest days in recorded history. There's this big Arctic blast polar vortex that's descending upon Texas. And for some reason, the people who built the torch center decided it's Houston. We don't need it. You don't need heating. Air conditioners enough. So I said, it's not smart to do a bris in the torch center when it's scheduled to be like in the twenties. So we're doing it at the Young Israel of Houston. But what I wanted to share with y'all today is what happened on Friday night. So as you may or may not know, the Friday night after a baby's born, there's a get-together, a party, a celebration called the Shalom Zachar, which Shalom means either welcome or peace. Zachar means a male. It's only after a male. And what effectively happens is there's a, there's a party for the people in the neighborhood and people drop off cakes and cookies and uh, we go to the liquor store and get some spirits i got some tequila and bourbon and scotch and we had some beer and i told someone i said this is the this is the first time i've been at the liquor store since the last time i made a shalom zahar <laughs> and and in fact, I even have some leftovers from the scotch I bought uh, almost two years ago. But uh, we bought like, I don't know, 50, <laughs> 50 beers. I don't know, I, I don't know how, much, yeah, how, much, how much beer people drink. And a couple of bottles of scotch and some bourbon. And um, there was some tequila and Arak. And um, actually, we didn't finish all the beer. So there's a, a gentleman in the neighborhood who's whose wife is expecting, I said to him, I touched him after Shabbos, I says, if your wife has a baby boy, I got plenty of beer for you. And uh, he responded, actually, we had a baby boy this morning. Oh, huh. So this upcoming Friday night will be a Shalom Zachar in their house. And last night I dropped off 35 beers by the front door. So now they have beer for their, for their Shalom Zachar. No. Don't, don't be... Oh, hopefully. I know beer no, doesn't. Um, I don't think it lasts. Is your phone on? I'm hearing like an echo here. I know, but something's. I've got it on mute. No, I don't want mute. I want the audio coming out to be muted. That's what I'm doing. I've got both audio and everything here. Let me see. I'm hearing some rumblings. Um, you hearing also? It's the. It plays with my brain. Up. I can look. I can turn off this. No, I can't do that. Let me figure something out. So what happens? We let uh, we let Rod do uh, Sandy's job, and suddenly well, it's all sorts of problems. Well, I see it's it's muted here, and over here. Well, why do you, speak you? Why don't we just? Um, I can still hear. I bet one, one of these guys can figure it out yeah. really quick. Boom. <laughs> no, let's try this That's again. That's 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 can you still say something? Hi, hello. You hear anything? I, why don't you just leave the leave the group, and it's fine. We'll, okay, uh, I need to have somebody in charge. Let me put San, uh, Nancy. Nancy, in charge. Nancy, you're in charge. You have the keys to the kingdom. Nancy, you're the boss now. Don't let it go to your head. <laughs> I can find Nancy's it. been nominated. Don't go spend all the money for <laughs> Yeah, go buy a new cow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they can hear you because you're still on mute. Yeah, no, they but can't hear Rod's you. been making lots of jokes. <laughs> okay, I'm out. Okay. You're in you, charge. You have all the dictatorial powers, Nancy. Okay. Shoo. Okay, much better. Yeah. That would 
So we're going to have a Shalom Zachar on Friday night. And now my friend's going to have one this upcoming Friday night. And it was lovely. There were lots of food. And we invited the whole neighborhood. Everyone came. All sorts of singing and, and divrei Torah, words of Torah. And as I merited with all my boys, I spoke by the Shalom Zachar. And I want to share with you today what I said on Friday night uh, to the assembled guests at the at the Shalom Zachar in our home. Now there are, there were different cohorts, you know, different waves. I, it started like at eight fifteen, eight thirty, and the last person showed up like after like eleven thirty ish. So it's like a pretty long party, and they sit around and there's lots of chatting and. You know, a few of the rabbis from the neighborhood, I asked them to speak as well. But I, I actually spoke twice because there's, the, you know, different groups. The first wave came and I spoke. And then the second wave came and I said, well, I still see some people here that were, that were present. The first time I spoke, so I said, I have to speak to something else. I got I can't repeat content. You know, I got a reputation to uphold here. So I actually divided what I'm going to tell you today into two different parts especially because it's a little bit longer than what is typically expected for a Shalom Zachar speech. So I said, you know what? Let me divide it up into two different uh, parts. And uh, then I could share with you the entirety of, of the message, but I don't, I don't want to inundate the crowds. This is what I said Friday night for the Shalom Zachar uh, for our new baby boy. Why do we have the Shalom Zarcha? Why do we have this ubiquitous custom, the Friday night after a baby is born, there is a celebration? What's the reason for it? So all the sources agree that it relates to what transpired to the baby at birth. In particular, the Talmud tells us that a child before they're born they know all of Torah. Once they're born, well, the angel comes, slaps them on the mouth, and makes them forget it. So the child went through a very traumatic experience. Imagine you, you, you know all of Torah, like everything. And suddenly you show up this big bad world, angel comes to smash you in your mouth, and poof, you forget it all. That's a That's a tragedy. That's a... Devastation for the child. That's a calamity for the child. We have to comfort the baby. The baby's mourning to a certain extent. So we get together and uh, we sing and we try to raise the spirits of the baby. That's the idea that everyone says, all the commentaries, when they explain this custom. Talmud tells us, again, decide the Talmud, the book of Nita, page 30b, it's a very iconic teaching of the Talmud, talks about the child in utero, and uh, before they're born, there's a candle lit upon its head, and it sees from one end of the world to the other, and it knows the whole Torah, and it's time to be born. Angel comes, smacks it on its mouth. Made to say, forget the whole Torah. The angel adjures the child, make sure you're righteous, live a good life. If you're righteous, it's great. If not, you're in big trouble. And the baby is born. So the child comes into the world, totally ignorant, knows nothing about Torah. And now it's a long process to try to recoup, to recapture some of the Torah that it had previously. That's the idea that is the cause of this, of this custom. So there's a few questions. You know, at the, at the Shalom Zachar, they always put out chickpeas. Always, every Shalom Zachar, you don't do this chickpeas. Why? Because chickpeas, that's a food of mourning. It's like round and round things, just like, you know, Jacob made lentils to, to you know, for to bereave, for the bereaving father, because Abraham died. Round things are symbolic of a way to comfort those who are mourning. So we have chickpeas. But I, I said to the crowd, I said, look around. I see lots of alcohol and drinks and candy and all sorts of delicacies, and everyone's chatting, and we're singing, this divrei Torah. This does not look like a somber experience that would be appropriate for, for mourning. It looks quite jubilant. So what's the inconsistency? If we're really mourning here for the terrible lost child had of, of their intrauterine Torah, we should sit on the ground, and the food should be poor, 
and meager, then we should be, you know, crestfallen. But we're upbeat and we're sinking. And this is a party atmosphere. Why are we so happy? Why is there this inconsistency, this disparity between the purported reasons for this custom and how we and how we enact it, how we live it, how we actually fulfill it? Question number one. Question number two, it seems to be unrelated, but we'll see how it's related. Genesis chapter one, very beginning of the Torah. After a week of creation, the verse tells us that God assesses, so to speak, his creation. And he looks and he sees all that he made. And behold, vihine, behold, tov ma'od. It is very good. Tov is, is good. Ma'od is very good. So it's very good. God assessed his creation and determined that it was exceedingly good. And the Midrash tells us something very puzzling. Midrash says, what does it mean when the verse says that God saw all that he made and, and it was good? Tov. It was good. Very good. Tov ma'od. Says the Midrash. Tov. Good. That is a reference to the Yetzer Tov. To the good inclination. And when it says tov me'od, very good, exceptionally good, that's a reference to the other inclination, the yetzer, hara, the bad inclination, the evil inclination. That is exceedingly good. That's what the major says, Genesis chapter 1, the very beginning. And obviously this raises a lot of questions. Wait, what? The Yetzirah is called Ra for a reason. It's the evil inclination. How can you tell me that something which is Ra, which is bad, which is evil, is not just good. It's exceptionally good. It's Tov Ma'od. The Yetzirah, that's the force that is designed, is engineered to get us to reject God, to take a bad path, to deviate away from God's intended way of living. Yet the Midrash tells us that this is the embodiment of all that is good. Not just good. Great! How do we understand that? How can we say that the Yetzir Hara, the evil condition, is very good? Uh, I, I will tell you, I was warned in shul. One of my friends says, I'm coming to the Shalom Zakha tonight, but I don't want you to repeat any content. Don't tell me what you said by your son Shlomo's Shalom Zachary. Don't, don't, I, I remember what you said. So I said, I said, wait a minute, what did I say? And he says to me what I said. I said, don't worry about it. Not only will I not repeat, it's going to be way better. That's what I told him. And he came, and when he came, I said, okay, I'm ready to speak. And so I, so the way I, I, I structure, I said, I said to the crowd, I said, listen, I'm going to tell you a little bit of an idea that I said in the past. And then we're going to take a new approach. So I said to them, let's look at the approach. And let, let, let's kind of talk about what we said in the past, but we'll use that, in a, we'll take that in a different direction. Child in Euro knows all of Torah. When they're born, the angel comes and smacks them and makes them forget the Torah. Now, if, if this was all you knew, that the angel comes and smacks the child, makes them get the whole Torah. And I would ask you, where do you imagine on the baby, on the child, on the embryo, where, where do you imagine the child would be smacked? You want to get rid of the Torah. Where would you imagine, if you didn't know the location of the striking of the angel, where do you imagine the angel would hit the child to make the child forget the whole Torah? So, so all of us, so what we would have said is that you smack the child on the head. That's where the, the Torah ostensibly lies. But the Talmud says otherwise. The Talmud says, no, no, no. You smack the child on their mouth. Why would you smack the child in the mouth? That seems to be not the place where you would imagine the Torah would lie. So the Maharal one of the great commentators, he says something unbelievable. He says, you have it all wrong. We think that the angel is trying to make the child forget the whole Torah. That's not what's happening over here. The angel is doing something else. 
And as a result of, of that other thing, the child's forgetting the Torah. But the child forgetting the Torah is a byproduct of what the angel's actually doing. And he explains. At birth, the Talmud tells us, the child gets a Yetzahara, evil inclination. Before birth, there is no evil inclination. But at birth, child gets the evil inclination. And that's what the angel's doing. Angel's slapping the child on the mouth because that's that's actually the conduit, he explains, where the Yetzirah enters the person. And as a result of that, once the Yetzirah is present, then as a result of that, automatically, as a byproduct of that, the Torah gets forgotten. And why does the Torah get forgotten? Not because the Torah is eliminated, the Torah has been deleted, so to speak. No, the Yetzirah comes and it takes over and it supplants the primacy of the soul. And the soul is still there, but it's so deeply embedded within the child, it's inaccessible. It's inaccessible to the child. And what the what the Talmud, Talmud is saying, the angel comes smashing the mouth, it's not to make him forget the Torah, it's to insert the Yetzirah. And as a result of that, the Torah is effectively forgotten. It's still there, it's still present, but it's inaccessible. The links between the child and the Torah has been severed due to the insertion of the Yetzirah. That's what the Maharal says. And in truth, it's, it's obvious that that is the case. And I'll tell you why. We have two things happening here. The Talmud tells us two things happen at birth. A, it tells us the child forgets the whole Torah. B, it tells us the child gets the Yitzhahara. Now, we would think those are two separate things. Maral tells us, no, they're, they're just two elements of one transformation that happens. But there's a, a proof, an incontrovertible proof that these are the same thing. When the Talmud tells us that the child forgets the whole Torah at birth, it cites a verse in Scripture to prove its point. And the verse that it cites is Lefetach Chatas Rovates. It's what God told Cain in chapter 4 of Genesis. At the entrance, sin crouches. And that's the proof that the child forgets the whole Torah at birth. At the entrance, the child enters the world. That's when sin crouches because now you forgot the whole Torah. When the Talmud elsewhere tells us that the child at birth gets the Yetzahara, it also cites scriptural proof. And you know what? It cites the exact same verse. When the Talmud tells us that the child gets the Yetzahara at birth, it also cites a proof and it uses the same verse, Lefetach Chatas Rovis, at the entrance, sin crouches. Now we know if, if you have one verse, you can only te teach me one thing from it. So from the fact that the Talmud utilizes the exact same verse to tell us two things, A, child gets the Yetzirah, B, child forgets the whole Torah, it must be that it's the same thing. Only one thing happens over here. Child gets the Yetzirah, and as a result, consequently, the child forgets the Torah, and therefore only one verse is needed. And this is an insight. Oh, I'm elaborating here more than I said Friday night because, you know, the, the crowd's a little antsy. Y'all are a captive audience, right? Where, where are you going to go? They, they were antsy. So I have to kind of really say this really fast. But anyhow, it's also interesting, and I pointed this out in my book at the very early chapters, the, the Talmud tells us that when the child's in utero, they have a, a candle on their head. And we know candle is always a euphemism for the soul. It's the child before they're born, the, the, the candle's on their head. The verse in Scripture tells us, Ner Hashem nishmas adam, the candle of Hashem is the soul of man. But then it tells us, the verse continues in, in Proverbs, Chofes kochadre button. It is searching in the, in the chambers of the person's innards. So the question that can be posed is, wait a minute, is the candle on the head or is the candle in the innards? And the answer is, before the child's born, the candle's on the head. 
There's no Yesara, so the, the soul is supreme. And the soul knows all of Torah, and therefore the person, the child knows all of Torah. Comes along the Yetzara, and now the candle has been submerged into the inner, so to speak, of the baby of the child, and therefore the candle's still present, but it is far away from the person's consciousness. And that's why we've spoken about this in the past. When Abraham, when he studied Torah, the, the Midras tells us, where did he learn Torah from? So the Midras says he, he studied from his kidneys. His two kidneys became like two wellsprings of Torah, which is a very strange way to describe Abraham's Torah study. And the explanation <laughs> is that Abraham was able to access the soul, the candle that was buried within him, like in his internal organs. He was able to remove the influence of the Yitzhara and thus restore the things the way they were before a child's born, and therefore he was able to access the Torah that was always there within them. So in previous, in previous Shalom Zachars, we talked about this idea that the child forgot the whole Torah, but, but it's still there. And there's something to celebrate about the fact that even though the Torah may be very distant from the child, and the person's access to it may be curtailed, and it's effectively forgotten, but the truth is, within the child, deep, 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 deep within the child, the Torah is still there. And nothing has been lost. And there's a certain path towards the rediscovery of that Torah in the event the child overcomes the Yetzirah. So there's something to celebrate about the fact that even though it's been forgotten, it's not been lost. And it's still there to be rediscovered. That's what we spoke about in the past. This time we took a bit of a different approach. There's a very memorable episode in the Torah about a pregnant woman having a rough pregnancy. And of course, we're talking about Rebecca. Rebecca, she spends 20 years married with, with infertility. And Isaac prays and Rebecca prays and God answers them and she becomes pregnant. And the verse tells us that she had a difficult Pregnancy. The children were fighting, were scuffling within her. And she was exasperated by it. And she went to go speak to the prophet. And the prophet tells her that, well, you have twins and there are two nations within you. And they're going to always be at odds with each other. They will have a seesaw relationship when one is up, the other is down. But ultimately, the younger one will triumph over the older one. This is in the beginning of Parshas, told us in chapter 25 of Genesis. Now Rashi tells us the significance of this episode. Like, what is, why does it matter what was happening to her when she was, when she was pregnant? What's the significance of the, the jostling that happened within her? So Rashi says very iconically, very, uh, very uh, memorably, that these two babies that were within, were within Rebecca, they had a very different set of desires. And whenever Rebecca would walk past the Academy of Shame and Aver, the, 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 the Torah study halls of Shame and Aver, Jacob would sense that he is in close proximity to holiness, and he would say, I want to go join. And he would start making a move. He would start jostling to try to be born, to be able to go and enter the academy. And then when she passed a house of idolatry, Asav was awakened. He was stirred, and he made a move, and he wanted to be born. And that's why she was so disturbed by this. And she goes to the prophet. The prophet tells her, well, no, there's, there's two children here. Maybe she had originally thought there was only one, and she, she sensed very conflicting interests for the baby. There's two. One wants this and one wants that. And ultimately, the younger one will triumph over the older one. 
That's what we're told. And of course, Jacob is born, Esav is born first, then Jacob, and Jacob is grabbing onto the heel. We know the story. But there's a major problem with this, with this narrative. We establish very, very firmly that the child before they're born does not have a Yetzirah, does not have a desire for evil. Yet Esav, well, Esav is stirring, is making a move to be born when they pass the house of idolatry. So how can it be that Esav is desirous of idolatry before he's born? Well, there's no Yetzirah prior to birth. That's a that's a strong question. Now, if you study the citations very carefully, you'll find an absolute stunning correlation here. And this is there's a few parts here, so kind of listen carefully. When the Talmud talks about the arrival of the Eight Sahara, the Talmud concludes that the Yetzirah arrives at birth. Not beforehand, at birth. But there was a debate that happened before that. The, the Talmud says, well, when do you get the Yetzirah? Do you get it at the time of conception or at the time of birth? That's a fair question. But what's interesting about this, what's unusual about this, is the personalities, the people who were party to this debate. The Talmud tells us that this was a debate between Rabbi Judah the Prince, the greatest sage of his era, the architect of the Mishnah, and his Roman counterpart, the Roman Emperor. The Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. He was a great philosopher who became an emperor. And they, they were colleagues and uh, contemporaries. You know, the Talmud gives us these great stories how they would go study Torah together. There was a tunnel connecting their two palaces. And the Talmud cites a few of the debates that they had. And the Talmud tells us that Antoninus asked this question to Rabbi Judah the Prince. When does the Yetzirah, when does it begin to operate within a person? Is it at the time of conception or at the time of birth. So Rabbi Judah the Prince responded, it's from the time of conception. And then Antoninus challenged that, wait a minute, if the child in utero would have a Yetzirah, the child would kick their mom and would force their way out. So it must be, it must be that it is from birth. That was the retort, the response, the rebuttal of Antoninus. And Rabbi Drew the Prince says, you know what? You're right. I'm changing my opinion. And this matter was taught to me by Antoninus. Davar zelim, not Antoninus, the Talmud tells us. Rabbi Drew the Prince declares, this I learned from Antoninus. And then he says, you know what? I have a proof from a verse. Umikra misayaso. And there is a a uh, verse of scripture that proves his point. And he cites the verse of scripture, chapter 4 of Genesis, Lefetach Chatas Rovitz. So the dialogue between these two very important people, and it's part of a collection of debates that the uh, these two people had, and the leader of the Romans, the leader of the Jews, they had this discussion, when did the child get the Yetzahara? And Initially, Rabbi Judah the Prince was of the opinion that it, it appears at birth. Subsequently, Antoninus responded, well, if so, the child will kick its mom and leave, so it must be that it's from the time of, of birth, not from conception. And that it, opinion is ultimately agreed upon by all. Rabbi Judah the Prince comes around to the opinion of Antoninus, and everyone agrees, and even the, the scripture confirms the child gets the Yitzhak only at birth. So we so we have 
the background here of the Talmud, but here's where it gets really interesting. If you look at Rashi's commentary to the story of Jacob and Esau, now Rebecca, she's pregnant, and the babies are jostling and scuffling within her, and she's disturbed by it. When she passes the house of the scholarship, Jacob wants to be born. When she passes the house of idolatry, well, Asa wants to be born. She goes to the prophet. And what does the prophet tell her? There are two nations within you. And look at Rashi's commentary there. You won't believe what Rashi says. Rashi in his commentary to Genesis chapter 25. Rashi says, wait a minute. The way the verse, the way the word is spelled, the word goyim, which means nations, is usually spelled a gimel and then a vav, and then a yud, and then a mem. But the way it's spelled in the Torah, it's not gimel vav yud mem, it's gimel yud yud mem. It's misspelled, or it's spelled differently. It's spelled not goyim, but gayim, which means proud ones. There's two proud ones within you. Rush says, why, why does the Torah misspell the word goyim? You know what Rashi says? Ze Rebbe the Antoninus. This is referring to Rabbi Judah the Prince and Antoninus. When the prophet is telling Rebecca that you have two nations within you, he's also telling her that there are two proud ones, two great proud ones who represent these two personalities within you, Jacob and Esau, and that is Rabbi Judah the Prince from the side of Jacob and Marcus Aurelius Antoninus from the side of Esau. He's the proud one of Esau. So wait a minute. We have two people. Again, the Talmud, the, the, the verse says there are two proud ones within you. And what does Rashi say? That's Rabbi Judah the Prince and Antoninus. And subsequently when they are born, so there's, what, what is it that it means? There's like talks about reincarnation. What is it that it means? Put that aside. Just look at the commentary of Rashi. Ze Rebbe Antoninus. This is a reference to the Prince and Antoninus. And those two people, the Talmud records, they have a debate. When do you have the Eight Sahara? And initially, Rabbi the Prince says, well, you have it from conception. And if that was the if that was the conclusion, it makes sense. Okay, you have the Yitzhah from conception. So Asaf is, he is um, drawn to idolatry. But that's not what the Talmud concludes. Talmud says, no, no, there is no Yetzirah. And who tells us that? Who are the authors of that concept, of, 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 of this principle, that there is no Yetzirah before birth? It's the same two people that we're told are inside the utero when our question is, is being raised. It's a kind of a, a mind-blowing connection. The Talmud records a debate between Roger the Prince and Antoninus and Jacob and Esau, Rashi tells us, are Re Rabbi Judah the Prince and Antoninus. And, of course, this very much amplifies our question. The very same people who conclude in the Talmud that the Yetzirah does not exist prior to birth, they are exhibiting, or at least Antoninus slash Esau, is exhibiting a penchant, a desire, a proclivity, an attraction to idolatry, which we only imagine can be the byproduct of a Yetzirah. Now, I'll add another, another question here. I had to, by the way, this was all condensed like into seven or eight minutes. <laughs> we're not, we're like halfway done here. <laughs> Just to get a sense of, you know, of, of how... You know, it's a tough crowd, you know, especially everyone's drinking. They want to chat. They want to sing. And I want to speak, you know, you know me. I want to speak. I want to orate. But anyhow, listen to this question. My grandfather, the blessed member, used to say, he used to very much, uh, very frequently cite a teaching in the Zohar. The Zohar says, that if a person did not have a Yetzahara for immorality, they would have no zest, no excitement in the pursuit of Torah study. That's what the Zohar says. The excitement 
that can be channeled towards very bad, illicit behavior, when channeled towards Torah, it gives a certain excitement and freshness and novelty to Torah. So there's like a good way to channel what would otherwise be a, a very problematic impulse. So here's the, here's another question. Our problem was with, with Esav. If there's no Yitzhara before birth, how does Esav want to go do idolatry? We'll ask the same question about Jacob. If there's no Yitzhara before birth and you need Yitzhara to have a desire, a zest, a passion for Torah study, how was Jacob desirous of studying Torah? Esav's desire for sin, well, that flies in the face of the, of the Talmud's conclusion that there's no Yitzhara before birth. But Jacob's pursuit of Torah likewise raises the same question. How was Jacob so desirous of Torah that he wanted to be born when Rebecca passed the academy? Well, he had no Yitzhara, and that's the force that gives, a, gives someone a, a, a deep desire for Torah study. These are all our questions. And here's the answer. When the debate was posed, Rabbi Judah the Prince and Antoninus, when does a child get a Yetzirah? When does a baby, I'll speak correctly, a zygote, is it a zygote or an embryo or a fetus or a child? When do they get a Yetzirah? Well, what stage of the development? So the story of Jacob and Asaph would tell us all that the Yetzirah appears even before birth, because after all, we see Esav being desirous of idolatry and Jacob being desirous of Torah. And we know that desire, both for good and for bad, are the product of the Yitzhahara. So Rabbi Judah the Prince quite sensibly says, it must be, at least initially he says, it must be that the, the Yitzhahara appears at conception. Look at the story of Jacob and Esav. It's, it's proof. Jacob and Esav, that's you and me, right? On some level, in some dimension. And what does Antoninus respond? Im Cain, if so, boet beimo viyotse. If so, the child would kick its mother and go out. That's what Antoninus responds. The child would kick its, if the child had its era, it would kick its mother and go out. This is exactly what happened in Jacob and Esau. Both of them were very, very desirous to be born in respective in the respective uh, contexts. Jacob, when they passed the academy, Esau, when they passed the idolatry, and they were both stirring. But you know what they didn't do? They didn't actually be born. They stirred. They moved. They jostled. They were interested. But they stayed inside, right? So Antonius says, no, no, no. If the child actually had a Yetzara, if the child actually had a Yetzara, they would kick in its mom and they would be born. And you know what we did not do? We weren't born. And therefore it's a proof that we did not have the Yetzara. And thus these two citations are very complementary. <laughs> Jacob wanted to be born, but wasn't born. Esav wanted to be born, but wasn't born. And therefore, that is proof, says Antoninus, that there is no Yetzirah. Yes, they jostled. Yes, they stirred. Yes, they sought to leave. They made a move to leave. But ultimately, they remained inside. They did not leave. And had they had the Yetzirah, they would have kicked their mom and actually been born. This is the Yetzirah. The Yetzirah is the force that compels, that encourages, that amplifies a desire and helps it override any barriers or inhibitions or blockades or obstacles that may lie in his path. Esav, he had some sort of predisposition towards idolatry. And the moral talks about that. What was exactly that desire? But it was not the Yitzhahara. He had a certain essential predisposition towards this. And he probably could have channeled that in a proper way as well. Had he had the Yetzirah coupled with that innate desire, 
he would have battered through all resistance and been born. And on the flip side, Jacob had a certain predisposition, a certain proclivity towards good, towards the Torah, and had he had the Yitzhah, he too would have kicked his way out. But he didn't. This is the power of the Yitzhah. This is perhaps the definition of the Yitzhah. It's the force that amplifies the desires of a person and enables it, enables those desires to be actualized and to be implemented and over Writing and overcoming any inhibitions. And it can be used for good, and it can be used for bad. I'll give you an example of this. The Talmud tells us that the men of the great assembly, they made a very interesting petition. They made a petition. They told God, we don't want the Yetzirah for idolatry. We don't want it. This is the force that contributed towards the temple being destroyed. And this is what caused the sanctuary to be burned. And this is what caused the righteous to be killed. And this is what caused the Jewish people to be exiled from their land. This desire for idolatry, it's so destructive. You only gave it to us, they tell God, for our benefit. So we should overcome it and receive reward. We don't want this bargain. We don't want not it and not its reward. And therefore, please get rid of it. That was their petition. And they didn't uh, suffice, subsist with simply requesting. They fasted for three days in prayer to petition God to change the world and to remove the Yetzirah for idolatry. And guess what? They were successful. And God signaled his acquiescence to their request by sending them a message. Talmud tells us what, what happened. A note, a document fell down from heaven and on it, it said one word, MS, Emet, truth. And the Talmud says, this is the signet of God. The signet of God is truth. And this symbolizes, this signifies that he is in agreement with our petition. And the Talmud goes on to describe the Yetzirah, where it came from, what it looked like, and what to do with it. But they were able to conquer the Yetzirah of idolatry. And the Talmud proceeds and says, well, you know, once we're at it, let's get rid of the other idolatry for immorality, for illicit relations. Yeah, it's a propitious time. Let's get rid of all the Yetzirah. So they prayed for that, and they got that as well. And then a couple of days later, they need a fresh egg for a sick person. And guess what? Even the animals stopped procreating. They said, "Oh, well, this is this is maybe too far because you get rid of the idolatry, the, the, the you get rid of the desire for idolatry. There's nothing wrong. There's, you don't lose anything. You get rid of the the desire for immorality, and before you know it, no one is procreated." And everyone said, "Okay, this one we actually need. <laughs> this is what we need." So they said, uh, "But wouldn't it be great to maybe neuter it a little bit, uh, mitigate it a little bit? Let's let's try to kind of let's get rid of get rid of half of it. So we'll have it in in a kosher version, but not in a." Improper version. They said, no, no, no you, you can't do that because you know, there's no half measures. You see, they're all or nothing. So you know what? Let's blind it. So they blind, they blinded it. And they were successful, the Talmud tells us, in curbing the desire that people used to have for their relatives, for their like mothers and sisters. It used to be people were desirous of their close blood relatives in the same way they were desirous of of other women, maybe even more so. So they blinded the Yitzhara, so the person is no longer desirous of their, their mother and their sister. That is the conclusion of the Talmud. It's featured in two places, the Book of Yoma and the Book of Sanhedrin. Okay. Here's the question. The men of the great assembly, 
they made a petition, a very ambitious petition. They're going to get God to change the world. This desire for idolatry, we're going to eliminate it. And they, they pray and they fast for three days. And guess what? Lo and behold, they get divine approval. The Almighty accedes to their request. And he sends them a message. And a document descends from heaven, and it says the word MS, which is like the signet of God. Okay, we have a deal. Let's note this parachuted from heaven. Oh, there we go. Okay. The Almighty agrees. Wait a minute. Of the men of the Great Assembly, of this group of people, were numbered several prophets. And in fact, the actual Talmud, the Talmud says that they they got control of this Yetzirah and it, it was it was like a fiery lion and they didn't know what it was. The, the Talmud itself says that the prophet tells them this is the Yetzirah of idolatry. So the Talmud acknowledges that there are prophets amongst them. So why are they getting this divine telegram parachuted from heaven if the Almighty wants to signal his acquiescence to their petition, he should just tell the prophet. Isn't that what a prophet does? Doesn't the prophet serve as a go-between, as an intermediate between God and the nation? Why was it necessary for God to signal his approval with this document? And here's the answer. They wanted something. They wanted to eliminate the Yetzirah for idolatry. They have to know what that entails. If you are eliminating the Yetzirah for idolatry, something else will go as well. There's always a balance. Ze le'umas, ze asalakim, we're told. There's always a balance. If there's great holiness, there must be a counterweight. If there's idolatry, there must be a counterweight. And the counterweight for idolatry is prophecy. And thus, if you want to eliminate the desire for idolatry, necessarily you will terminate prophecy. The only way that someone can have the ability to storm the heavens, to penetrate the heavens, a human, a lowly, mortal, fragile, fallible human, can override everything. The vast gulf that separates the human and God. The only way the human can batter through that resistance is only with a super-duper Yetzirah. Not just the Yetzirah for the ones that we're familiar with, but the Yetzirah for idolatry, which was way, uh, a thousand times stronger. You want this? Great! But you know what you're forfeiting. You're forfeiting idolatry. I'll still send you a little telegram. But the idea of God communicating directly, that's over. That's the power of the Yitzhah Yes, it can lead to terrible devastation. It can lead to destruction, lights uh, that are described in the Talmud. The nation being slaughtered, the righteous people being consumed, the temple being destroyed, the sanctuary being burned, the nation going into exile. But you know what else it can bring with it? The ability to override all barriers, break down all barriers, even the barriers that are as stiff as those separating the human and God. We cited the Midrash. Midrash says, God saw all that he made, and behold, it was good. Tov. Me'od. Very good. Exceedingly good. Says the Midrash. What is Tov? That's the answer Tov. What's Me'od? What's super good? Exceptionally good? That's the answer Hara. You want to achieve good things? You need the Yetzirah Tov. You want to achieve exceptional things? You want to achieve stratospheric greatness? You can only do that with the Yetzirah. You want prophecy? You need to have a Yetzirah that's so destructive, potentially, that it could completely annihilate all of the great 
accomplishments that we have, the, the temple and the sanctuary and the nation and the righteous and the Jewish people's settlement of the land, all that is destroyed by this Yetzirah, and you need that to achieve prophecy. The only way to have Tov Ma'od super good is with the Yetzirah. That's the only way to do it. Jacob wants to study Torah. And that's great. He jostles, he moves, but he, he, he hits the brick wall. Not quite brick wall, but effectively brick wall. He wants, he's so desirous. It doesn't matter. He, you can't overcome. If you had the Yetzirah, you would be bowed, but you would say you would kick your way out. You'd overcome everything, both for good and for bad. Had Esav had the Yetzirah, he would have not just desired to do idolatry. When his mom passed the idolatry house, he would have kicked and forced his way out. It would have paved the path for his worst impulses. Had Jacob had the same force, he too would have battered through all resistance, overcome all barriers, demolished all obstacles, and gotten what he wanted. That's the power and the opportunity of the Sahara. We say in the Shema, Ve'ahavta, you should love Hashem your God. Bechol levavcha, with all your hearts. Hearts. They just translate it as heart, because most people don't have two hearts that they know of, at least. Maybe multiple ventricles, but not multiple hearts. But the actual word for hearts is levavcha. If you want to say just your heart, it would say libcha. So the Talmud says, wait a minute, what, how should you love Hashem your God with all your hearts? I only got one heart. Says the Talmud, the heart is reference to your desire. Bishnei Yitzarecha, you have to love Hashem your God with all your hearts, with both of them, with the good heart and the bad heart, with the Yitzar Tov, the good heart, and the Yitzarah, the bad heart. With both of them, you must love Hashem your God. Talmud tells us, you have to love Hashem your God with your bad heart, with your evil inclination. How do you do that? You do that by harnessing its power of Tov Ma'od, of very good, of enabling the great people to become prophets, of enabling Jacob to battle through resistance. That's how you deploy the Yetzahara, the evil inclination, the other heart, in service of God, in, in service of love of God, by using it to amplify and empower those desires. Now, when I finished speaking, someone told me a great story. He said that um, the great Chazonish, the greatest sage in the world, passed away 70 years ago. He uh, was once with a student, and they went to the they went to the water. They went to the water. They went to the, the Mediterranean. They said, we're going to go take a little break for the you know, time between the semesters. And he went with his student. Because imagine what it's like to go swimming with the Chazonish. It's like a, what, what, what an experience that is. So they're in the sea. And the student, he feels some splashing behind him. And he turns around and sees the Chazonish splashing, splashing him. Which is an unbelievable thing. It's like, what's going on? He says, you have to understand. The same impulse that I have to splash you, that's the same impulse that enables me to write my great books. It enables me to, over, to, to overcome all the difficulties and the challenges of trying to figure out Torah at unfathomable depths. It's the same thing. And the child, child went through trauma. Child, child forgot all of Torah. The candle that was upon its head is now within them. And where did that come from? That came from the Yitzhara. So you and I would say, that's that's a reason to be somber and to mourn. Well, of course, you know, we have to celebrate the child. But from the child's perspective, child knew all of Torah, forgot it all. Had no Yitzhara, now has a Yitzhara. So if we're really going to have an event to mark this transformation, it should be a somber one. That's what you and I would have said. But now we understand why it's a cause for celebration. Beforehand, the child, well, it could have accessed good. It could have been good. 
yeah, well, you want good things. It's so nice. Well, and I finally, I was joking. I was like, we know those kids. The kids who don't have a Yates and hurrah. I was, I, was, I was like trying to do a little stand-up a little bit. I said, you know those kids who are like, oh, is it time for to do all my homework yet? Can I brush my teeth already? Is it time to go to sleep? Can I finish the broccoli? <laughs> you know those kids. It's great. It's a nice thing. The ones who are capable of achieving great things are the ones that have a fire in their belly. They have, they have a tenacity and a fierceness. That's the answer within them. And that's the fire within them. And if they find a way to use that, it will be not only good, it will be exceedingly good. And of course, the loss of Torah, that's something that is the result of the arrival of the Yitzhah, and something we have to note, and we mark it, and there's chickpeas on the table. We, we lament it to a very, very minor extent. But we also know that there's tremendous joy and power and opportunity that's now available that was not available previously. Because you know what we're celebrating? We're celebrating the arrival of the Yitzhah And that is a cause to celebrate. Mm -hmm. Because now they have the ability to not only want good, but to want good with such power and such ferocity and such strength and tenacity and fortitude that they will kick down all barriers and get what they want. And that is the reason why we are celebrating. May we all weaponize our abilities, our good abilities, our good desires, our strengths towards the pursuit of righteousness. Love Hashem our God with all your hearts, all of them. The good one, of course. Bad one too. Bad one is what enables us to achieve transcendental greatness. It enables us to shatter all barriers, tear down the wall, any wall that's blockading us from our greatness. You may want it, and that's great. And the Yetzirah Tov will say, I really, really, really want it. But nothing will help you like the Yetzirah. When channeled properly, it enables us to overcome all obstacles. And of course, we hope and we pray that our young son indeed loves Hashem, his God, with all his hearts, is able to use his abilities for good, and is able to become someone that makes the entire family, of course, the community and the nation and the Almighty proud. And uh, tomorrow, please God, you'll you'll find out the name that we've selected by the by the Bris, please God. And uh, we hope we can uh, incorporate him into this great nation, into the covenant of Abraham. And uh, please, I will see good themes from him and from all of his siblings. And I appreciate your attention. I hope you have a wonderful day and a fantastic week. And of course, my email address is RabbiWolby at Gmail. Dot com. Okay, let's open up the floor here for questions. Um, so can I ask a question? I just want to get, an, get this straight. I, I, Raz asked me a question, but you probably don't hear him, so I'm going to repeat this okay. question for those who are... Who are... I'll, I'll also speak up. Go ahead. So before the Great Assembly yes. made the appeal to have the Yetzer, Yetzer reduced for idolatry, Yes. This is the reason why Paros magicians had access to a higher level of understanding with their magic because they also was connected to a higher level of the Yetzer that had not been depleted yet, correct? Does it make sense? Because that the great assembly is what was like, take the desire for idolatry away, but it affected the whole world. Yeah. I, I, so, Does so that make the, sense? No. yeah. So the question is, what, what, what power? If I'm, I'm going to re rephrase your question. What power did the idolatry actually actually have? Right, right. Uh, and the answer is that it had some power. Right. Because there has to always be a balance. You know, if you have a Moshe, you must have someone who also has powers of the same level, and it was powers from the other side, as we're as we're told. You know, what did Abraham give his other sons? He gives that he gave them the names of Tuma. Right. Names of impurity. It means that there are powers Ancient that people, yeah. can, yeah, that can be used uh, towards very negative things. And we we believe that the stargazers and even some of the uh, the pagans of yore they had abilities that they were able to marshal for their nefarious purposes. Yes, absolutely. Makes sense. 
Yes. Okay, Paul in the Paul in the chat here is asking a question. Why no shalom zakah for girl newborns? Not asking you to reveal, but have you already selected the name? Okay. Um, first of all, Paul, thank you for your kind words about the lesson. Um, I uh, appreciate them. So uh, there's no shalom zakah. There is a there is a, a different party that we made for girls. There's a different party that we made for girls. That's the what's called a kiddush, also known as Shabbos. So that's the real. That's the answer that I would tell you. Um, I think in this context, you would have to, I mean, in the context of, of, of what we just shared, you would have to say that this is more pertinent for boys than girls, and that's why the, the nature of the party is different for the boys and for the girls, but they both have parties. Um, have we selected a name? We have. Uh, but it's still subject to change. Until the brisk comes, we uh, it's not finalized. So I'll let you know. Yeah, and it's tomorrow morning, not at the Torch Center. It was supposed to be the torch center, but then when they when they tell us that it's going to be 20 degrees and there's no heating here, or there's kind of a little bit of heating in the other room, but not here, I, I said it's just not it's a terrible idea. Um, so that's why we're going to do it at the Young Israel of Houston. Now, I'm, I'm not inviting anyone here. I'll tell you why I'm not inviting anyone here. Because you're not supposed to invite anyone to a bris. Because you know what? If I invite you to the bris, you know what happens? <laughs> You all better show up. And bring money. It's the rules. No, no, no. The rules are if you invite them to the bris, they must, yeah. must come. You know why? Because this is like, it's like inviting them to the Super Bowl, right? I have, I have tickets, 50-yard uh, tickets to the Super Bowl. You have to come. You can't not come. But it's the Super Bowl it's times a 1,000. Because Elijah the prophet's going to be there. And you're not going to show up. Imagine telling Elijah the prophet, ah, sorry, I got to go to work. You know, I got to push papers. I got to be a paper pusher. You gotta be a bean counter. I'm not showing up to Elijah the prophet. So you can never invite someone because if, if you do invite them and they don't show up, it's a terrible, terrible indictment on them. So what you instead do is you inform people. Someone's informed. I'm informing you. We'd rather be a bris tomorrow at uh, uh, nine o'clock at the Young Israel of Houston. I'm, I'm, I'm informing you. Do with that what you wish. You stand at the window. You'll see that whenever there's an invitation, it's not really an invitation. They'll always say, we would like to inform you about the bris. No, no one will invite you, because if they do, you're in big, big trouble. You get in the plane, you get in the car, you must show up. But I have a job. Doesn't matter. Quit your job. Show up. <laughs> so that's why everyone's informed about the bris tomorrow. Please, God. Yes. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Cheyenne. Thank you, Rabbi. Um when you were talking about the need for the office, like the opposite, um, is that why like the more you're growing, the, you know, the more righteous you're becoming, like hopefully that's where what's happening. Is that why you feel like more of a sense that your Yatsahara seems to be getting worse? The more, I don't know, you keep growing in things. Is it because not, of that? Yes. Yes. Position? Yes. Not only is that uh, a sense that you should have, it's necessary. It's necessary, and it's 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 the Talmud says it. I cited it in my book, uh, the Talmud book, and uh, the book of Sukkot on page fifty-two a on the bottom says very clearly: the greater you are, the greater yira you have. So yes, those will always go in tandem. That the the more someone elevates, the more of yitzra they will get. So yes, absolutely, that would be an example of this same phenomenon. There's always there always has to be a balance of power. So yes, very very astute point, Cheyenne. Uh, David. So, I I have so many questions about the Yetzir Harak. I literally could spend all day with you. Um, it's it's hard to it's hard to narrow it down to one. But but I, I'm fascinated maybe even obsessed with trying to understand what the Yetzirah is physically or, or in existence. And I'm trying to, is, does the Yetzirah actually join itself to our soul, soul uh, uh, akin to our soul affixing itself to our physical body is it sort of like a a uh, a mirror image of that dynamic? I mean, does it does the yetra actually physically 
become part of the soul or attached to the soul? So um, I did send you a copy of my book, right, David? Yes. So I spent a lot of time in the book addressing these questions. Um, the exact uh, con the connection between the creator and the soul completely depends upon the degree of righteousness that a person has. Every a sin by definition is a binding of the soul to the Yitzhara. And thus when a person dies, you have okay. to you have to separate the two. You have to separate the two. And depending upon how righteous a person is, that will determine what the nature of that separation is and how difficult it is to undo. So yeah, I, I it's a very, very sharp question. Very, very sharp question. And the answer is it depends. Because the the definition of righteousness is that the soul is not allowed to get sullied and harmed by the Yetzirah. That's the definition of righteousness. When someone preserves and maintains the purity, uh, the pristine purity of the soul, that's the definition of righteousness. Not just an element of righteousness. Does that make sense? And the, and the, it does. And the, the, the difference... What's what's the difference or relationship between the animal soul and the Yetzirahara? So that gets into the, that that gets into the the nature of so, of the soul. So we did speak about this. This I didn't write about in the book uh, because I didn't get to that that technical level. Uh, but the the you know the soul is often presented as as a string as as a as a chain as a chain that links different things together. And it's vertically, it's vertically um, <clears throat> positioned, meaning that there's parts of the soul that are above a person, and there's some parts in the head, and some parts over here. Like where you put your tefillin over here specifically, because that's where one part of the soul is, or that's where it rests. And other parts are in the heart and in in, in the liver. Um, so that there, there is a there is a, a low, a, the lower parts of the soul are, are more close to the touch points that a person has within them. If that makes any sense. So, like the the animal soul is like almost like the glue soul that that binds the the higher higher soul with the lower physicality. But the the overall objective of life is to make sure that the soul does not get enmeshed in physicality because that is very harmful for the soul. Question. Okay, go ahead, David. Is this kind of alluded to in, in Yeshayahu 7 where it talks about the child by the time he learns to reject the bad and choose the good? Um, is it is that alluding to that? Before the lab knows to reject the bad and choose the good, the ground with two kings and bread shall be abandoned. Like I know Can you give me the citation there? Seven what? Yeshayahu 7 16, I believe. 15, 16. Mm -hmm. So I will I will look to see if the midrash or the Talmud connects it, because it does sound similar. It does have a similar flavor to it, right? I was wondering about this passage in that context. Yeah, potentially. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't know. Uh, Dave was asking about the a verse in uh, Isaiah, chapter seven. It talks about uh, the the child, uh, kind of the maturation of a child, and uh, the stages in which the child knows to reject bad and accept the good. I'm looking at the commentaries here. I want to know if this is connected to what we're talking about. The commentaries don't seem just. I'm perusing here on the side of the uh, online. I don't see anyone that makes this uh, explicit connection. So maybe I don't know. Maybe it's about his it, the wherewithal, like his, his soul within him to to harness it from a young age. Maybe that's what it's maybe it's talking about him being an exceptional. I would always want to. I would always want to see the context to see and see what Rashi and see what Radak what they how they interpret that verse. Um, so I wouldn't jump to conclusions quite yet. I would have to kind of study it more more thoroughly to offer an opinion. Okay. 
Which verse is it? Seven sixteen. Isaiah. So I have a question, Rabbi. Yeah, go ahead. In the time of Mashiach, who's going to overthrow the idols, the idolatry? Mm. So your name is John, is that right? John's question is, in times of Messiah, who will overthrow the idolatry? What about, why is this a question only for the times of Messiah? Well, is there a question that's now? Because in the prayers, in the prayer, it's, uh, that's when, no, yeah, yes, it could be now. But... So you, okay, so John's question is like this. If the prayers indicate that that the time of Messiah is, a, is the re removal, the banishment of all the detestable idols from the world. Well, who's going to do that? Who's going to do that? It's a great question. Well, I would say, if I had to just say very simply, I would say, well, that's the job of Messiah, right? It's a pretty uh, difficult to-do list. Eliminate all idolatry. Oh, and build a temple. Oh, and, uh, you know restore all of law and bring all the Jews back and all that. So that's what I would probably answer is that um, the, the true answer is we don't really know how Messiah will happen, especially because we do know for sure that there are different ways that it could happen. It could happen because of us or despite of us. We spent a lot of time when we, sp we studied Messiah, we spent a lot of time about this idea that there are, there's variability to the different types of Messiah. So maybe that's the answer, is that that will happen, either will happen because of us or despite of us, either to our benefit or to our detriment, but it will happen. And exactly how, well, that's that's kind of to be determined. So it says that their, the knee, all, all knees will, will bow, their eyes will overthrow yes. and all the knees will bow. Yes. So the question is, in this discussion of Yetzirah, in this discussion of Esau, uh, uh, he's He's moving, and when you go by this house of idolatry, okay, maybe it is that that his intent is to create more idols and to populate the earth with idolatry. But maybe it's also to come to the conclusion that that's worthless, it's super 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 valueless. And maybe the job of of uh, Esau and the descendants of Esau, like this Roman is to realize. Yeah, so that as your question is about is about Asaph. You know, Asaph seems to have a a, a desire, a predisposition towards idolatry. Is that for a good cause or for a bad cause? Meaning, is there a way or is there a version of events in which Asaph actually becomes the champion of God by saying, I was there, and it's a bunch of malarkey, as we were suggesting. Um, so th th this discussion is a very esoteric discussion, but what we do know for sure is that there's a lot of references that talk about the final frontier of Messiah being the battle against Asaf. And there are sources that I found, and I think we might have spoken about this quite briefly, that talk about Asaf having a reclamation, Asaf coming around. And when Jacob kind of grabs the heel and overcomes him, actually he brings Asaph, he brings Asaph with him. When they descend to Mount Seir and they have the final showdown, whatever that means, and Asaph is finally defeated, does that mean that Asaph is eliminated or Asaph is reformed? Asaph is um, he he repents, and that that's a um, a discussion that we see kind of different versions of it. But there is a version of of of, As of Asaph um, repenting and rejoining, so to speak, the family of Abraham together, by the way, with Ishmael. Together with Ishmael. Uh, but there's also an idea, and again, we don't know for sure until this will happen. There's also an idea that Asaph is going to be eliminated. That kind of wing, so to speak, of the Abraham family will be um, excised. So which one it is, who knows? But it's definitely, there is some sort of pending showdown with Asaph. Transformation makes sense to me. Uh, mm -hmm. Makes the most sense. Echad makes the most sense. What do you mean, Echad? Oneness. Unity. But the question is unity, unity. Uh, you, that, that that's definitely it. Like Biyomahu on that day, Yeshem Chad. The 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 description of Messiah is that on that day God will be one, meaning there will be universality and acceptance of God. But does that mean that all the forces that were bad will be transformed, or maybe the ones that are beyond transformation will be eliminated? 
regardless, it could be all regard the oh maybe a little bit of both. That's right. So that's the that's that's really the question. The result of Vayomahu Yesham Achad. That's the verse in Scripture. It says that, and that's in the aftermath of the battle with Asaf or the showdown with Asaf. Uh, will be God, God is one. The question is, well, how, how so? Will it be by Asa being transformed and uh, remedied, or will it be by Asa being eliminated, or some version of the two? And I think the answer is it's still an open question. Yeah, TBD. Now I see in the chat here, uh, Pat asks, bullying is a negative use of ourselves, but if that is transformed into productive debate or useful sparring, so to speak, perhaps it is Harnessing the etc. So this is a, a an exa excellent example of the, the general notion that we're trying to convey, and that is that it's possible to use all bad things, all bad things, or things that could be bad. It's possible to use them in a good way, just like Asaf. You know, Asaf had a certain predisposition towards blood. He was a redhead. First thing we talk about it, he's a redhead, a red, ruddy, and he's going to want to kill people. That we know for sure. We know there was someone else who wanted to kill people. The word admoni is. Uh, assigned to two people, on only two people. One's Asaf, and one is David. That's right. David is the other other side of the coin of Asaf. He had the same set of characteristics, but deployed in a very different way. That he became the you know the king of the Jewish people for all eternity. So that would be another example where you could harness the Asara for good, and that's the objective. So bullying is a good example. You know, if you if you bully your bad character, that's a good thing. It's a very good thing to bully bully bad character. That's a beautiful thing. You know, you bully you bully someone who is more vulnerable. Who is you know you bully the the misfortunate and the underprivileged and the weak and the feeble. That's a bad use of it. So that's a good example. Working on the not-so-good characters. Yeah. Yeah. yeah now, you'll. I, I need some more um, details, Pat, on your second question. I don't exactly understand it. Could you clarify what you mean by that? Yeah, there we go. Looking for the unmute button. Um, yeah, so I think someone in your, the class was asking about, will Messiah do this or, or that? And... Um, I'm thinking, aren't we all supposed to participate in that as, you know, as kind of the body and doing our own part of course. To, yeah. to do that? So that's that was kind of the essence of my question. It's, yeah. it's not just like uh, Messiah will just like take over and do it all, um, right. but we need to participate in that. That was kind of the essence we wanna, of my we question. We want to partner, right? That's right. Anyone who does righteousness and tries to um, proliferate righteousness in the world is effectively a partner with Messiah. You're part. You're part. You're part of this um, nationwide, global, really, his you know, history long effort to bring God into the world and to create that echad, that universality that exists in heaven, to bring that, to bring parity between heaven and earth, which is another way to say what you said, right? A certain parity. There isn't two different universes, so to speak, in heaven and earth. It's the same. When there's parity in heaven and earth, mm -hmm. that's when you know Messiah is here. Right. My uh -huh. question is kind of rhetorical. Okay. We like rhetoric. Huh? We like rhetoric. <laughs> well, I mean, who, who knows what the next, what's going to happen? But but back, but bringing it back to Esau, which is simply the deceit. What was there a struggle to? Hey, I need to get out of here and take care of, and get rid of this idolatry, or was it to get out and? To, promulgate and to perpetuate. Maybe, maybe it could have been both. That, that's why he had free will. He had the ability to choose both. <clears throat> you know, there's a, a whole um, theme in the literature that Asaph was supposed to be the fourth forefather. It was supposed to be Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Asaph. Fourth forefather. Really? Yeah. So it's called forefather. I don't... Four. I think there's, a mm -hmm. there's definitely a podcast about it. Yeah. That's, that's why it's called the forefather. Well, I know there's four, there's four, there's the four, uh, ten was a four. Well, he was supposed to be married to Leah, that's right. That's right. He was supposed to be married to Leah. And then there are two versions of who actually did it, right? There's one version that Jacob himself had to kind of, he had to wear the garments of Asaph, meaning he had to kind of impersonate Asaph. Mm -hmm. Is this bothering you? 
shift my side. Oh, that's the, oh yeah. Okay. So uh, Jacob himself became, there's one Jacob, there's one Israel. And he had to kind of play both roles. He had to wear both hats. He had to marry both Rachel and Leah. Mm -hmm. There's another version that uh, that David's kind of the fourth father. Because David is the reincarnation, so to speak, of Esau mm -hmm. in the good version. He's the Admoni who pulled it off. He's the red, the, the ruddy one who was able to actually become, you know, the, the Messiah of Hashem, Mashiach Hashem. Is there a connection with when you were first started, you mentioned about why does the angel you know, flip the mouth? Why not smack him in the head? Or at least smack him on the back end. Why not? Why the mouth? But then I just thought Deuteronomy uh, 30, 14 talks about it's on your mouth. It's on your mouth. Yes. So Torah is actually there. And until we're able to start speaking it and praying it and reading it and consuming it, it comes back. Mm -hmm. So we are kind of resurrecting Torah when we study it. Yes. Or when we speak it or pray. Or a whatever. very, very sharp observation from Rod. Rod's connecting the smacking of the mouth and that being the conduit through which the Yitzhah was inserted with what Moshe tells the Jewish people before he passes, that the Torah is beficha, in your mouth, ubelvavcha, and in your heart, la'asoso, to do it. So very, very astute connection. Very sharp. Rod? Sharp. That's you. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. That's right. That's right. That's right. Okay. Who else here wants to chime in here? Anybody Online else? and in person. Um, let, me, let me turn around and show what I'm seeing here. Sure. Well, hi, guys. In the torch hunter, you used to touch this here. Hello. Oh, I Hello. I know this is recorded. <laughs> Someone on YouTube is going to watch us like, what? <laughs> <laughs> anyhow, anyhow. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Initially. Okay. And that is, you responded that there always has to be a balance between the negative, positive, and the mm -hmm. positive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in the plagues, it was not evil. You know, they right up front knew that they were not the plague that they did, that they copied was not as good as what God did, that they this was really God that was doing it all, you know? So how did that balance? Very, very, very good question. When you have Moshe doing a real plague and the necromancers say, oh, we'll copy that. Take the rabbit out of the hat. No. Yeah. One of them is, is a real miracle. One of them is just a sleight of hand, right? So where's the balance? You want to hear the balance? Very sharp question. Very sharp question. The answer is like this. It's a real miracle versus a fake miracle plus plus what you really want. And that's how it's perfectly balanced. Oh, you know what? They I really know. wanted to, they really wanted Moshe to be a fraud. They really, they were looking for any excuse to not have to change their entire lives. And they're biased Plus, you have some, well, this is a miracle. That's a miracle. Yeah, it's not the same, but, but, but whatever. You know, it's, it's enough for you to say, let's 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 ignore the subtle differences between the two. Oh, it's good enough, you know? When you have something you really, 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 really want and you very much don't want to change, change your whole life, if you can find some excuse, so to speak, to kind of hang your hat on, that balances it out. And by the way, that's the same same thing that it's just within our lives every day. Like, it, it, our soul is much more powerful than the Yitzhara. Mm -hmm. It's much more real. But you know what the Yitzhara has going for it? Everything else. <laughs> <laughs> and it, ha it has pole position. It's more primary in our consciousness. And it's what tells us, don't really change your life in a way that's so different. Oh, come on. It's so much easier. You're good enough. You're so good. You're so good. You worked so hard. Oh, okay, fine. You know, there's the balance. There's the balance. Like uh, the Mishnah says, you have to chase after a mitzvah and you have to run away from a sin. Where's the balance? The mitzvah's running away from you and the sin's chasing you. Where's the balance? The running boat. Yeah, but one, you're running away to avoid a sin and one, you're running to chase, to chase down a mitzvah. So if you do nothing, the mitzvah runs away from you and the sin catches you. Enter the soul so much more powerful that the only way to make a balance 
is if the the relative, so to speak, appeal of both sides is skewed in favor of the Yitzhara. Go ahead. So this is a lightweight question. A couple of children ago, you told us this was desirable. Does he claim? <laughs> you know what? And the question is, does the baby cry a lot? I think that you just develop, you know, people have thick skin. They get thick ears. They're like, you know, first time the baby cry, first baby you have, baby cries, it's like, oh, what do we do? I don't know, what do we do? That's not like, you know, do I, is baby crying? I don't know. Can you tell? Yeah. So much other noise going on over here. Oh, <laughs> over the din, the cacophonous din of all the noise. You just walk right past it. Right. <laughs> you just miss it. So I, I, I think you build a tolerance for kids crying. So like, I'm like, I'm like, I, the kid doesn't cry so much. I don't think. No, but they, thank God the kids, it's good for lunch. It's good for lunch, right? To, to cry a little bit. You like that. It's a yeah, but we like that because it means you didn't really want to come. Oh, you want to be able to cry at birth. Yeah. At birth, at birth specifically. Well, then the the, the, mish, the Midrash does say that the, when the child cries at birth, it's really the soul that is crying within them. The baby actually did not cry so much at birth. There's a point. <laughs> <laughs> I guess maybe knows. He got the eight Sahara now. It's not so bad. Not so bad. But the, they say it's good for the good for the lungs to cry. Um, but um, Rabbi, do um, I have a question? Do um, premature babies who are born way premature, do they get shortchanged the Torah? Like, so I was born two and a half months early. Well, it means do you means, get the whole. It just means you're very you get the whole Torah, or you, did mean, they? Okay, it means, okay, it means you're very precocious. You you much faster than everyone else. <laughs> That's what it means. <laughs> You don't did need I so get much the time. whole thing, or did they like? Of course, you get the whole. The whole thing is implanted in the soul. Okay, good. Just my asking. Kids are, my kids are mostly born two weeks late. Hmm. I was like, I would way say, always, always the late bloomers. The late bloomers. Okay. Takes them a while to get it. I was wondering. It's a great question. Okay. This was a ton of fun as it always is. Um, oh, Sandy has some questions. Called it very good. Yes. Are we call, are we creating confusion and a misunderstanding by calling it evil? No, we have to know both. Uh, Sandy's question is: Wait a minute, is it very good or is it very bad? Why do we call it? Why do we have different names? Good. Why do we call it? Right. Both. Are good. I tell you the truth, because no. God also calls it evil. God calls it both good and, and bad. How do we know that? Because the verse says it in Scripture, "Yetzer leva adam rami nurav." When God says, "I'm not going to destroy the world again after the flood," He says that the Yetzer is evil. So He calls it both good and evil, because it, it is both good and evil. It's the essence, really, of free will. Yeah, yeah. It's the essence of free will. It's what empowers the people to do incredible things, but also terrible things. So I think that confusion is the is the essence, because it's really up to us to determine which one of those Yetzirah, are, are we using the Yetzirah to love, to love Hashem our God, or is it controlling us and manipulating us and um, directing us towards bad places? And that's in our hands. Like Esau. Like Esau, exactly. Mazel was blood, but he could have been David. Yeah. Mm -hmm. or he could have been a doctor. That's right. Should have been David. Should have been David. And uh, kind of off topic mm -hmm. and being a little bit silly. Uh, your podcast. Um, actually, I think Apple did fire Steve Jobs. That was the joke. <laughs> <laughs> that was the joke. Uh, uh, most people didn't get that, right? Anyhow, I, I that was having a fun time, you know. Uh, Sandy was saying that my parsha podcast last week, uh, I made a joke about torch can fire me. I was saying like we torches have a great um, paternity uh, 
leave, paternity leave. So, but they got to fire me. It's like Steve Jobs being fired from Apple. And uh, Stanley pointed out that Steve Jobs was point was fired from Apple. <laughs> 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 and then that was the joke. So, uh, but yeah, um, I did that. know that. And that's why I said it. <laughs> uh, that's funny. That's funny. But even when he was fired, but they brought him back. Yeah, so. Can the uh, Go ahead, Mike. affect physical things? I remember listening to a podcast and the rabbi was having some technical difficulties and he mentioned the Yitzhahara. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I misunderstood it, if, if, if it can do that. I thought that sounds an internal thing. But so. Uh, this question I would send you also back to my book because the Yitzhahara operates within a person, with outside a person, inside and outside. Um, I uh, just want to repeat my question for those of y'all who didn't hear it. He was asking, does the Yitzhara, uh affect the physical world or just the internal world? And the answer is both. It, it, it affects internally and it affects externally. Now, to, for us to make a determination as to, you know, this the Yitzhara creating a challenge for me or not, we don't know exactly. We can't, you know, it, it's one of the things that you say, oh, the, the Yitzhara doesn't want us to do us. That's why, you know, he's causing us technical problems. Um but the answer does affect the world around us and affects us internally as well. So it's it's the answer is both. The answer is both. And, and the interplay between the two the is both too. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course, of course, of course, of course. Yeah, but uh, interesting That's question. Yes. Because what you what you start conceiving in your mind and and in your internal, it starts manifesting outside. You get opportunities. If you want to do mitzvahs, conceive it, mitzvahs come to you. That's right. right. That's right. That's right. And if they don't, by the way, the Talmud says that you try to do a mitzvah and that doesn't work out for external factors, you still get the reward because mm -hmm. the real reward is in your heart when you try to try to do it. The implementation, well, that's not always in our hand, right? Our job is to choose good. And that's really where the point of leverage that we have is, right? Whether or not we should actually do good, that's sometimes not in our hands. So therefore, we're, we don't really have a say in that. So we choose good and for whatever reason doesn't play out, we still get the reward. Okay. Was this fun or was this fun? It's always good. I want to thank all of y'all for coming to the Torch Center here. I used to drive all the way up to uh, Humble, you recall. Right. I have to say, I do not miss that drive. I don't want I do not miss that drive. And you were doing every... Oh, my. That's one of the good things that Corona brought for us. <laughs> Coronavirus. COVID. Bad, 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 but just like the eight hour eyes. Well, it was a little bit good there as well. Yeah, and Pat loves Zoom. I love Zoom also. It's great. I have to say, it's much easier to edit, edit the podcast also. Because everyone's on mute. This, yeah. Yeah, you're driving very good. But you'd have to do it if I invited you to the Baris. <laughs> Especially probably with, you know, 15 feet of snow, whatever you got in Duluth. Probably a lot of snow now. Um, but uh, I'll see everyone. So uh, we'll continue, please God, first Sundays of every month. Uh, which will be, I think, uh, January, uh, February 4th or something like that. Something like that. I think it's February 4th. Because February 11th, I think. Yeah, February 4th. Yeah, no. Um, I will be out of town for the last January, uh, Sunday of January. So um, you'll, you'll, someone will still have the class, but it, it won't be me because I'm going to be out of town. Um, I'm actually flying that day. We're going to Canada. It's a story. Kai's brother getting married. So um, you know that I don't miss unless I'm just not, not going to be able to do it. So are you having a pitch hitter or? Well, we got a pinch hitter. Yeah, we got a pinch hitter. Um, or you want to, I'll probably be like in the airports. I guess I could do like in the airport, walking around. I'll put well, it... No, you did that once. You remember driving? You were going to Pennsylvania. Oh my goodness. I was so bad. You did that. the whole class in I your did. <laughs> That worked every time. Do you remember that? I was very. He was in the car. He got out of the car. He went into a convenience store, and he was just doing the class. Oh yeah, yeah. So well, good stuff. But we wouldn't want you to do that. Okay, that's that's asking <laughs> too much of a man. Okay, everyone, this was delightful as it always is. I'll see everyone, please, God, next week, same time. And uh, thank you all for coming here, for coming on the Zoom, and I'm um, looking forward, please, God, to another. Uh, uh, great week, please, God, and uh, I'll see y'all on Sunday. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye.
Bye, everyone. I'm closing the room. <laughs>